So I know it's only a few seconds into the video, but this is typically where everybody goes straight to the comments section and never run a turbo without oil. Well, yeah, you're right, except for this is a mock-up turbo. And if you don't know what that is, then stick around. Uh, maybe you'll learn something else while you're here. So this is my 2016 Yamaha Bolt XV950. It's a fuel-injected V-twin. It makes less horsepower than my YZ450, but it really delivers the fun and extremely reliable torquey pull that will satisfy most. Except for me. For no other reason than because I can, I opted to skip the bolt-on options and go straight for the built-on options, which brings us to the turbo. Mounting a turbo to a V-twin is relatively tricky. I mean, you have a few things that you have to consider, and none of them are universal. So wherever it is that you decide that you want to stick it, make sure that it's going to work out. In order for me to confirm where I wanted mine to go, I just kind of took a couple of measurements with the turbo floating in place and went over and cut a new bracket off of my fast cut, completely out of scraps. Which, by the way, I recently made the upgrade thanks to Hypertherm to the PowerMax 65. The cut quality is absolutely phenomenal. Wait till you see the flanges that I cut for the exhaust. Once I had the bracket built, I tossed it onto the bike hanging off of an old bracket where the air filter used to mount up to, and then I hopped on the bike to test it out and make sure it fits kind of where I want it to. Now, for reference, I'm roughly six foot three. So the things that I'm looking for, I want to make sure that the exhaust potentially won't burn my leg. If I have the mid controls like I have, or if I choose to switch it to like forward controls later on, it should be about the same. I need plenty of clearance because there's not a whole lot of space for me on this bike. I kind of look like a monkey in a football. But I also checked it side to side. I want to make sure that it doesn't feel too heavy on one side versus the other one. Granted, there is a little bit more weight, but we're going to try and keep that down or minimize it as much as possible. But all in all, it feels well. So it's time to get working on the manifold. I started the manifold with a 45 degree stainless mandrel bend from JMD Tubes. It's an inch and three quarter round with an 065 wall. The stock is something like an inch and a half, so this diameter will flow a whole lot better. With the 45 now cut into two pieces, I cut them both in half again vertically to create the merge for the turbine inlet. The diameter is the exact same as one piece of tube, which is an inch and three quarter round. Stainless prep is ridiculously important for a full penetrating weld. To keep this vid short and sweet, all of my tubes are prepped as follows. First I cut the tubes to length or size in the bandsaw. Then I clean up any little burrs and face them to minimize gaps in my fit up. Gaps will almost always guarantee you have a miserable time welding because they can cause you to slow down, which means the part gets hotter. Thus, the uniformity, as well as the strength, goes right out the window. Once the tubes are faced, I grab a red surface prep pad and completely brush the area to be welded, followed by cleaning the inside out with a flap disc drum on my air grinder. This gets everything nice and clean, as well as uniform, which is key. Just before tacking the parts together, I clean with either acetone or methanol to remove oils and dirt and other things that can cause impurities. So with the merge collector cut and prepped, it's time to tack. If you're wondering why each elbow is a different length, it's because it's going to be cut to size once it's tacked together. There is no sense in trying to guess where or how it's going to fit on the bike. Just tack it up and cut it to fit later. I'm not purging during the tack right now because we're just barely sticking them together for the moment. Full penetration is not required for the tack and the metal will still have to go through a final prep stage before full welding where it will be purged. My inlet flange was cut out on the fast cut. Very simple pattern actually, but unfortunately I don't have the footage for it. But while that was happening, I did go and trim off the face of that merge collector where it actually came together. And then I placed it all up onto the bike. Now, in order for me to figure out my flange orientation, I held up a mandrel bend to the rear leg of the merge collector and eyeballed its placement. This will show me which way the merge needs to be clocked and how much I need to cut the rear leg down in order to clear the mandrel that will end up attached to it. With the other hand holding the merge collector in place, I marked out the clocking reference on both the collector and the inlet flange. Before tacking up the merge collector to the flange, I cut the rear leg down since it will be much easier without the flange attached. It was pretty tricky even without it. Now something I have to keep in mind about the flange itself is a friendly little thing called distortion. Since everything is subject to movement during fabrication and welding, the flange itself will be the last piece to get fully welded. Only a few tacks will hold it on now because I may have to adjust the turbo later. The factory head flanges are kind of interesting. 
The rear cylinder uses a full floating flange that compresses a fixed boss into the gasket while the front cylinder uses a fixed flange and boss combination. In order to resist cracking on the new manifold, I will make both front and rear cylinder ports full floating. This will allow the manifold to flex more during heat cycling, which should help avoid cracking. After taking some simple measurements, the head flanges were drawn and then cut out on the fast cut. This is the quality I was talking about earlier. The flanges were cut using Hypertherm's book settings and nothing needed to be adjusted. I absolutely love this machine combo. The factory bosses measured in at 0.67 inches long, which I rounded up to 0.7. Then they were cut out of a 2 inch OD 120 wall tube, the closest size to the factory size that I have on hand. To ensure the point where I measure all of my runners from remains the exact same every time, the flanges and the bosses were bolted up to the cylinders by themselves. I'll permanently weld the bosses on later. And now to tackle the rear cylinder runner. I started with a mandrel bend cut to 90 degrees, which aimed the runner at the rear cylinder port. The complete runner length is something I am keeping in mind because the front cylinder will have to be just as long in order to have an equal length manifold. After eyeballing my cut length, I marked out a clocking reference to the merge collector and tacked it all together once prepped. With some scraps I had laying around from a previous build, I found a near perfect bend that flows nicely over the crankcase. This is simply cut down to approximate length, which was enough for me to take a measurement from the rear port to the runner. This measurement will tell me how long to cut the bend that comes out of the rear port. Again, utilizing my scrap pile, I found a bend that looks like it will match quite well. With a quick glance kind of measurement, I marked it out and took it to the saw. With both bends now loosely fit to the bike, I can mark out my cut length for each. I always overcut these legs because you can always take metal away, but you can't necessarily always put it back on. So after a couple of trips to the saw and a few trim cuts to get everything dialed just right, it was time to tack it all together. Without a doubt, my favorite part of the fabrication process, aside from staring at the finished job, is the part where I get to assemble everything and see it come to life. I love it so much that I often completely forget to follow my own rules and start rushing into it. One of my tubes here didn't get the full brushing on the outside, but it definitely received the inside prep, which is good because I don't have to cut it all off to do it right. I'll just have to clean the outside later and tell myself to slow down in the future. As far as distortion goes, the best way to avoid it or keep it at a minimum is to prep your tubes correctly like we discussed in the beginning. Fit up is a key player, but the next big thing is in the tacking process. At a bare minimum, you should have three tacks on all of your parts and they should be equally spaced. With a perfect tight fit up and equally spaced tacks, the tube will have a really hard time pulling in one direction versus the other. Now if you want the very best chance of avoiding distortion, tack your parts in quadrants and in opposing sequence. While I had the part off, I decided to throw down a few additional tacks to the flange. I also tacked on the boss for the port. Once I saw it back together on the bike, all tacked up, I was loving it, so I wasted absolutely no time to get working on that front runner. Despite seeing an internal wastegate present on my mock-up turbo, it won't actually stay on it because I am fitting a tile 38mm external to this manifold. I'd like to have a little bit more precise control over the boost, and let's be honest, a titanium screamer pipe would just look sick. I also needed to match the runner length to the rear, which means the front runner tubes are going to have to take a pretty serious detour as we're very quickly running out of space. I figured the best way to tackle this is to send it down to the ground and hang a Yui. The front runner came together pretty quickly almost streamlined. The only issue I really had was finding a position where I wasn't blocking the camera, which I found to be pretty difficult. My best looking shot was something like this, which really doesn't show much. However, the J-Bend was cut and tacked together just the same, and then the real challenge of fitting the front runner to the merge collector began. One of the trickiest parts of manifold fabrication is nailing the position of the final pieces. Respecting the perfect fit-up rule can be tough, particularly when the two tubes needing to be joined are on two different planes facing two different directions. In this instance, that's exactly what I was dealing with. Now, I debated showing all the trips back and forth to the scrap pile on the saw just to find the right piece, but that's a lot of footage. Instead, I'll tell you to take your dear sweet time and keep trying the right combinations until you nail it. 
Two tubes can be flipped four different ways, and each can be rotated 360 degrees. If it helps you to know, making several trips to the saw for the slightest trim cut like this is completely normal. Once I was satisfied with my fit up, I marked the tubes and dragged the welder over to the bike for tacking. And that's exactly the moment where my camera started acting all kinds of weird. It died and somehow lost a bunch of my footage. And that's just the downside of building one-off parts, I guess. However, the next day presented an opportunity to teach. The class that day wanted to learn about welding stainless tubes, so I took the time to teach them as much as I could while I welded the manifold up. Even though I don't have the footage for it, we did a full final prep on the tubes, got them all brightened up, cleaned, wiped, everything was ready to roll, and we purged it. Now, we currently offer welding classes six days a week here at our facility in Las Vegas, where you can learn welding and fabrication with a trained and certified TFS instructor. Sometimes I even get a chance to throw in a little more for those in attendance. Now, if you want to learn more about fab and welding classes we currently offer, check out the video card or the link in the description of every video we upload. My camera issues continued onto the wastegate fab. The footage just wasn't all that great. Now worming this tube into place proved to be tricky because it had to sit on the merge just right without hitting the cylinders or any other tube. I typically like to make sure my two port merges are divided equally instead of slapping the wastegate on just one runner. Now with all of that welded up, I squeezed in a little oil into the mock-up turbo and gave her a couple revs. So what exactly is a mock-up turbo? It's basically a cheapo knockoff turbo that you don't really care about. It's a throwaway. The reason for using cheap turbos for mock-up is that you can run them, cut them, modify them, drop them, beat them up, and test fit them for just about anything before adding the real one. It's a cheap solution for one-off builds. The real turbo I plan to use was the Garrett GT15. It originally mapped out to be the closest size to my power requirements. The only downside is it would start to fall off somewhere in the 5,000 RPM range, which is where I want my power to be the most. I really didn't want to sacrifice my top end, so I snagged a hybrid turbo from across the pond. This GT22 is originally built for diesel engines that don't exist here in the States. It uses a 2 series cold side with a 17 series hot side, which is held together by the same GT15 CHRA. This maps out to be just right, without being too much. Well, that's all I've got for this episode. As always, I appreciate you watching.